Artista Reinhold Dysenhofer says the big trend in recent years has been SUVs and station wagons with an off-road look. Many manufacturers just make their cars look robust. But when an automaker known for its all-wheel drive vehicles builds an off-road wagon, expectations are high. Following its new generation A4 sedan and station wagon, this summer Audi will release the second generation of its popular all-road Quattro. For the new A4 all-road, Audi did more than raise the standard Avant a few centimeters. It overhauled the entire chassis, and the drivetrain has something new as well. Instead of always powering four wheels, now the all-wheel drive engages only when it's really needed, and it kicks in fast, within a quarter of a second. What's new about the A4 all-road, says Reinhold, is the Ultra Quattro Drive. In the old generation, both axles were always powered. Now the rear drive line is uncoupled when it's not needed. And that can save a third of a half a liter of fuel per 100 kilometers. If you're leisurely cruising and don't need four-wheel drive, the system uncouples the rear axle. Then it engages again when needed. How has the exterior changed? Well, the headlights with the jagged edges stand out, but the all-road's trademark is its widened wheel arches. The all-road has 34 millimeters more ground clearance than the A4 Avant, so Audi says that can keep going after the pavement ends. The wheel arches and bumpers are usually painted in a matte gray, while the underride guard and rear diffuser provide silver accents. We're testing the Audi A4 all-road Quattro with a 2-liter, 140-kilowatt diesel engine. This version sells for 44,600 euros in Germany. The Drive Select system ensures good performance on any road surface. The new off-road mode supplements the choices offered by the preceding generation. Reinhold sums up, Audi's A4 all-road Quattro combines good driving comfort, utility, and off-road capacity. Thanks to its all-wheel drive and greater ground clearance, it keeps going when the going gets rough. Our car tester Ronnie Levstek is crouched beside a Japanese sports car, the Subaru BRZ. He says it's unusual for a Subaru. It doesn't have all-wheel drive, but rear-wheel drive. It was built in collaboration with Toyota, and its boxer engine gives it a low center of gravity and a beautifully flat front. The BRZ offers a pure driving experience, no frills, no elaborate electronic technology. 53% of the car's 1,212 kilograms rests on the front axle, 47% on the rear. The engine's low center of gravity increases the car's stability. This sports car is great fun on curvy open roads. Only flying could be better. Ronnie is astonished at how beautifully the Subaru BRZ handles on curves. You're in perfect control. The steering's as sharp as a sushi knife. There are few options with the Subaru. The BRZ only has one chassis, one engine, two transmissions, and two trim packages to choose from. Its engine has an output of 147 kilowatts, but the maximum torque of 205 newton meters is not achieved until the engine reaches 6,400 RPMs. This purest race car is affordable too. The sport version costs just over 32,000 euros in Germany. Ronnie loves how the BRZ takes curves, but he's not satisfied with the engine. Despite its 147 kilowatts, it doesn't seem powerful. He wishes he had a turbocharger because it doesn't really go until you reach five or 6,000 RPMs. And of course, that means high fuel consumption. 
The Subaru BRZ has the ideal proportions of a classic sports car. Its windshield is placed behind a long hood and the rear is short. The diffuser has an integrated dual exhaust. The flat construction of the boxer engine keeps the front low. The cockpit isn't crowded with levers and knobs. That fits the BRZ's pragmatic style and focuses concentration on what's most important, driving. Thanks to the low bucket seats, driver and passenger sit tight. The interior has a charm reminiscent of the 1990s and is dominated by well-crafted hard plastic and imitation leather. Ronnie says this car is definitely his favorite for taking curves, thanks to the boxer engine's low center of gravity, almost perfect weight distribution, and stiff suspension. The Subaru BRZ is fine for everyday use, as long as you don't expect it to be the primary vehicle for a family of four, because the back seat's about as roomy as the rear shelf in other cars. A base model Subaru BRZ starts at just under 30,000 euros in Germany. The iconic Mercedes SLK Roadster has changed its name to SLC, and it comes in five different power levels. The top model, the SLC 43 AMG, has a 3-liter dual-turbocharged engine that puts out 270 kilowatts. The basic SLC model costs 34,927 euros in Germany. Volkswagen is presenting the new edition of the UP. The city runabout has had its exterior facelifted, but there are some technical innovations as well. The Beats version has six loudspeakers around the interior. The new UP is slated to hit the German market in fall 2016. Volkswagen hasn't yet announced what it will cost. A big rig and a smartphone. At first glance, they don't seem to have much in common. Our reporter, Matas Kurat, begs to differ. Taking a closer look, he discovers that the smartphone and the truck have lots in common. Only a few years ago, truck drivers were left to their own devices on the road. Devices like the CB radio, which only worked within a limited radius. Their GPS was a road atlas. And if they were lucky, they had a cassette deck for music. The first mobile phones, if they had one, looked more like a briefcase than a telephone. And using them just to place anything but an emergency call was too expensive for truckers on a budget. But Matas remembers how phones kept getting smaller and cheaper. They acquired the ability to send text messages, and trucks got their own fax machines, so the dispatcher could send jobs or other information straight to the driver in the cab. Today, sat-nav and telematic systems are indispensable to the road freight industry. Trucks report their positions to a control center along with status reports and alarms, making for a much smoother overall flow of operations. Al Matis makes the comparison with a smartphone, which also sends out user data, such as the current position. Many people store their contacts and photos in the cloud. The telephone can even tell which friends are nearby and contact them, or it can download information over Bluetooth from special transmitters. Drivers use vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle or vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. Trucks equipped with these systems can warn each other about road hazards and traffic congestion. 
This is a key component of the continuing automation of road transport operations. In autumn 2015, Daimler presented the self-driving truck equipped with Highway Pilot, a system that uses sensor data to steer the truck autonomously on the highway. Now Daimler has introduced the next level, the Highway Pilot Connect, which strings several vehicles together into convoys, called here platoons. Matas takes the opportunity to climb into a truck together with Daimler's head of pre-development, Martin Seilinger. The Highway Pilot Connect is based on the Highway Pilot that Daimler presented in October 2015. What advantages does it add? The Highway Pilot automates front, back and lateral control. That's the system's basis. And Highway Pilot Connect establishes a radio connection to other vehicles in the group. The truck that's the farthest ahead signals to the others its willingness to form a platoon. The drivers are notified by the display and they can activate the Highway Pilot along with the Highway Pilot Connect. The next truck then follows in the slipstream of the one ahead. And the driver doesn't have to steer. A monitor displays the view from the cab of the lead truck so he knows what's ahead. Matas asks what the advantages of platooning are. Seilinger explains that this electronic hitching, as he calls it, lets the vehicles rely on one another. One truck follows another, and the distance between them is reduced to just 15 meters. Matas points out that in Germany, vehicles on the highway have to maintain a minimum distance of 50 meters, and the system's 15 meters is quite a bit less. Is it still safe? Seilinger asserts that it is, explaining that the driver's reaction times are variable. But with the electronic hitching, they don't have to worry about that. There's a maximum of a tenth of a second delay in the system's response. The vehicle reacts immediately to what the lead truck is doing. That makes a distance of 15 meters safe. Around 400 sensors collect information continually and can even spot obstacles before the driver does. People behind the wheel have a reaction time of about 1.4 seconds, but the Highway Pilot Connect conveys the brake signal from the lead truck to those in less than a tenth of a second. Montes realizes that this means the distance between the vehicles after an emergency braking could be longer than if a human had applied the brakes. Seilinger confirms that. He adds that stepping hard on the brakes will automatically trigger a full stopping maneuver and keep the distance between vehicles constant. But there are other drivers on the road who might try to cut in between the trucks when they exit the highway, for example. Mata says a car has just merged up ahead. How will the system cope? Seilinger replies that the system will increase the distance. It does this with the help of a plausibility check. The distance the radar sensor detects combined with the GPS data shows that another car has merged in between the two trucks, and so it sets a greater distance. If, for example, a lane is closed and the trucks have to change lanes, all the drivers in the platoon will have to steer manually. The system has a provisional certification, and the market launch is only waiting for legislative approval. Industry-wide standardization is needed so drivers will be able to use the technology, no matter what brand of car they have. Matas is amazed that over 100 million lines of software code go into the modern tractor-trailer rig, more than in a passenger plane and way more than in a smartphone. So the phone and the truck have much in common, but while he can load 32 gigabytes of data onto the phone, if he tried to load it with 32 tons of freight, the difference between the two would be crushingly obvious.
Seat's Cupra models are the cream of the crop among fans of the Spanish brand and fans of sportiness and practicality. Since a Leon Cupra rounded the Nürburgring's north ring in under eight minutes in October 2014, the cars with the checkered flag on the grill have been on racing's radar. Yeah. Car tester Andre Zimmermann explains that Seat is celebrating a very special birthday this year, the Cupra model's 20th. He describes the Cupra as a fiery Spanish car. It's Seat's top sports model with 290 horsepower instead of the 280 in other Leons. That translates to 7 kilowatts of added power. The first Cupra got along on 110 kilowatts, but then it was an Ibiza that had shed 1,100 kilos. Four years later came the sporty Ibiza's second generation. The first Leon to bear the Cupra name appeared in the year 2000. At the time, nobody suspected that Leon would put its hottest model out as a station wagon, and much less that a 2.8-liter V6 and all-wheel drive could be replaced by a turbocharged two-liter engine with front-wheel drive and still be faster. One thing all Cooper models have in common, they've furnished the basis for race cars that are still competing in one make racing series today. But this Cupra has to hold its own on public roads first. Andre likes the engine a lot. He points out that when he's cruising at low speed and 2,000 RPMs and he steps on the gas, it needs a moment to respond. But in two and a half seconds, it's flying. It presses him back into the seat. He says that's quite pleasant, but if you want real fiery Spanish passion, you can downshift once or twice and enjoy the high RPMs. Two hundred thirteen kilowatts are at the right foot's disposal. If the driver shifts fast enough, this model can leap from zero to one hundred kilometers per hour in six seconds. But as customary for street legal vehicles, the Cooper's top speed is capped at two hundred fifty kilometers an hour. The Cupra. Andre tests the Cupra's driving modes. First, Cupra mode. If it's Cupra, he assumes it should be sporty, but he thinks the suspension is a bit too stiff. Even at the age of 25, Andre's worried he'll lose one of his discs, so he much prefers comfort mode. It doesn't feel squishy at all, comfortable, but stiff enough even so. Then Andre switches to individual mode, which the owner configures himself and sets everything to the Cupra mode, except for the suspension. Now he's found the ideal combination for him to cruise easily but speedily down country lanes. There are a number of settings for the Cooper's handling as well. Unlike its VW Group sibling, the Golf R, Seat doesn't take the all-wheel drive road but sticks with front-wheel drive only. Andre realizes that many people may not like the front-wheel drive, but he's convinced it's ideally suited for the Leon's character. It's not just about going fast, he says. You have to fight for it and keep a firm hold on the car, so all that power on the front axle doesn't just fly out the window. To keep that from happening, Seat installed a special differential lock, and the Leon ST Cupra is 100 kilograms lighter than the Golf R. That shows up in fuel consumption as well as in handling. Overall, Andre has a positive impression of the Leon Cupra ST, not just because it's Seat's sportiest wagon, but even more because it's so versatile. He can round hairpin curves in Cupra mode or cruise along easily in comfort mode just as well. On the Cupra's 20th birthday, he congratulates Seat for turning out such a beautiful car.
Every April, car lovers flock to Essen, Germany for the Techno Classica. It's the world's leading trade fair for classic and vintage automobiles. Here you can find fully restored and extremely expensive classic cars, alongside those that hope to be classic someday. This Ferrari dealer says when it comes to a classic like this, fully restored essentially means rebuilding the car from scratch, and that's reflected in the price. Some of the vehicles on show here change hands for several million euros, but most people will never be able to call one their own. Outside of the exhibition halls, the price tags are lower. You'll still see the odd car in the 100,000 euro range, like this Ferrari 308 GTS, but others are more affordable. This man retired last year and is looking for a hobby. He'd like to find a car that's not been restored, one he can rebuild. A Citroën DS20 or DS21 or maybe a humpback Volvo. He was a salesman, so he has no professional experience, but figures he can pick things up on his own. This year, the electronics and modern classics is a hot topic at the show. He says they're looking into the issue. In future, they might be able to update devices and rework the electronics. Until four or five years ago, they thought it wasn't possible. But now they've changed their minds. He says, we'll see, times are changing. Before, they also said old carburetors were beyond repair. Now, they just manufacture the parts and fix them. Car clubs are represented here too. Their members are happy to show off their pride and joy. Many have remained true to the same brand for decades. This man says they're the cars we knew in our youth, the ones we learned to drive with, and they've stuck with them. The Techno Classica could also be called the world's biggest spare parts depot. Dealers from across Europe have parts to fit almost every model ever made. Collectors can also pick up die-cast models and other automotive memorabilia. Some car manufacturers are also promoting their brand's history. This year, Porsche has brought along its 924, 944, and 968 trans axle models. This red 924 was the design prototype for the successful model. It's a museum piece and not for sale. The head of the Porsche Museum says, yeah, trans the trans axle has the motor up front and transmission in back. It was a milestone in Porsche's development. Another eye-catching car at the Porsche stand is this 911 2.5 ST, which won many a race in its day. Back then, its owner, Michel Kaiser, and Porsche factory racing driver, Jürgen Bart, took turns behind the wheel. The head of Porsche Classic tells us that a Swiss collector discovered this car in the U.S. in a state of utter disrepair, parked in a field. Children used to play in it. Luckily, someone checked the car's serial number and realized what a treasure they were jumping around in. He's glad the car eventually found its way to the Porsche Works and Zuffenhausen. Schatz hier eigentlich gespielt wird und letztendlich fand dann glücklicherweise das Fahrzeug seinen Weg zu uns nach Zuffenhausen. It took two years of hard work to return the 911 to its original condition. Porsche's Uwe Makrutski explains that it's not a regular series production model, but one that was specially modified for racing. So you couldn't just open up a repair manual and see how it worked. They had to do tons of research and ask people who were involved in the project back then. You don't have to be an antique car enthusiast to enjoy a visit to the Techno Classica. But looking around at these gleaming cars of yesteryear, you might just become one.